Hello, I'm Stefan Kreber, I'm project leader for LexD, and today I'm going to be uh, looking at BurrFS, which is the next uh, storage driver in this current series on LexD storage. BurrFS is actually the most used of all storage drivers on LexD. Uh, despite our preference for using ZFS, uh, BurrFS is the most commonly used primarily because it's uh, the storage driver used on Chromebooks. And we've got a lot of Chromebooks out there. Um, so that makes it the most common. It is a pretty featureful storage driver. It supports a lot of the same features as ZFS does. Uh, but there are a f like one main thing that it supports that ZFS is just learning to do right now, um, as well as a few downsides. So we're going to be going through that now. Um, I've got here the documentation open for, for BurFS. So it's pretty similar to what I showed in the previous video for ZFS. We've got a brief overview of what it does, some amount of terminology around it, and then uh, caveats in this case around quotas, which I'll touch on in a minute, and then configuration options. There's not a lot as far as configuration options for BurrFS. You can effectively just choose some custom mount options for it, and that's about it. The rest are just the, the common mount options, or common storage volume options that LexD supports. Um, so let's go just over the briefly the main advantage of BurrFS and then some of its downsides. The main advantage for BurrFS is that it supports nesting. So if you create containers on top of BurrFS, you can actually Learn, uh, run LexD or run Docker or run something else like that inside of the container. And those tools will be able to themselves create bur uh, BurFS subvolumes and use BurFS features. Not all features, only a subset of them will work, but it is quite useful and uh, is why we tend to prefer using BurFS to, for example, run Docker inside of LexD. That's really its main benefit. Uh, now, kind of looking at some of the downsides, the initial one would be around virtual machines. Uh, BurrFS doesn't natively support storing block devices like ZFS does. So when storing a LexD virtual machine, what you end up with is just a big file on disk, uh, which is just created by LexD there and is used to store the VM. It's the same story as when you use it on top of a directory backend, for example. And uh, the main downside to that approach is that it's not exactly ideal as far as copy and write uh, on the file system. It can be quite a bit slower than something more native like what ZFS, LLVM, or Ceph provide. Um, it can also be a bit tricky um, for BurrFS to do proper snapshots in some cases um, because of that big, kind of big mapped file that the VM uh, relies on. So that's something to keep in mind if you primarily want to run virtual machines, BurrFS is probably not the, the best solution for you. Um, ZFS would probably be the best, LVM would be an alternative option there. Now, for containers, BurrFS works just fine, uh, but there's another limitation that kind of uh, shows up there and it actually Im uh, impacts containers quite a bit, but also impacts virtual machines. And that's the way quotas work inside of BurrFS. So it is possible to apply a quota on top of a BurrFS volume. That's, as far as this is concerned, that works pretty much the same way as we do for ZFS volumes. You set a size on the volume and that's it. What you will see, however, is that it is not extremely strictly enforced, as, it is, as in it is possible to actually exceed that, um, that quota in some cases because BurrFS um, applies quotas somewhat lazily in the background, and as soon as it notices, we then prevent any further writes. So that's not necessarily ideal, but that's also not a huge issue. Um, it's primarily visible with virtual machines, where um, if things are not properly set up, BurrFS might miscount the, the disk usage and then prevent writes, which is a bit annoying. Um, but overall, it's not usually a big problem. Where things get a bit weird uh, is that BurrFS quotas don't quite work the way most people would expect. Um, the, I think the way most people would expect it to work is you apply a quota on a specific subvolume uh, within BurrFS, and then that subvolume is restricted to that amount of space. And if you create a nested subvolume, then the quotas would apply 
to that snippet of volume itself, um, unless a more specific smaller quota is applied to it. Now, that's effectively how it works inside of ZFS, but that's not how it works inside of BurFS. BurFS effectively has two different trees. It's got one tree for the BurFS volumes themselves, and it's got a separate tree for quotas. And you can effectively then relate a subvolume to a specific um, quota group entry, which then applies the quota. That wouldn't be a big issue if that was just like an internal detail that XD can take care of. Um, where things get a bit weird is that it makes it very, very trivial for someone to bypass a quota. Um, specifically in a container, all you need to do is have a new user, even a privileged user inside the container, run burrfs subvol create blah. And then blah is a new subvolume, which does not inherit the quota of its parent, which means it's completely outside of the quota applied to the container. And it makes it very easy to use all disk space on the host system. So for that reason, we don't really recommend using BurFS on any, any environment where you need to tightly control the amount of disk space that a given instance can use, uh, because a like either a misbehaving piece of software or a uh, potential attacker inside of the instance can pretty easily bypass the quota entirely and then fill in um, the amount, total amount of disk space available. So that's really uh, one of the potentially worst limitation that we have currently on BurFS, and that's pretty easily disqualifies it for many, many use cases, unfortunately. Other than that, that's pretty much it. Uh, BurFS is otherwise pretty fully featured. It supports compression. It supports multiple devices. Um, it's not doesn't have as many configuration options and keys as something like ZFS, but it is pretty fully featured and has the advantage of uh, being inside of the mainline kernel and being readily available just about everywhere. And LexD support is pretty good. It supports pretty much everything that Lex that uh, BurFS itself supports and has been pretty solid. Like with DAL limitations, as I mentioned, but other than those, um, it's otherwise pretty good. All right. Um, so just go take a quick look at how that all functions. Let's switch over to a terminal. And it's the same system as last time. I'm going to just run next in it here. So let's just set things up. And this time, instead of using the default, which would be ZFS, I'm going to save one BurFS, create a new pool. Um, again, kind of similar to the ZFS video, you can choose whether you just want a loop disk, uh, a loop file on disk, or use an existing uh, block or partition. I believe I can use one of those. So let's see if I can probably do yes. And then the NVMe 0 and one p 3 I think is the partition that's available. And I'll just go move, move on with that. And here we go. Okay, so now LXD is initialized. The storage we can see is BurFS. Uh, similar to what, Z what we do for ZFS, um, because BurFS can be backed by multiple disks, we don't record the particular partition that was passed as the source. Instead, we record the file system ID, which the kernel can then identify and figure out what disks actually backs the thing. So that's why you see that. Other than that, launching an instance on it will work pretty much as one would expect. So it's downloading the image, we'll unpack it, create initial subvolume, uh, and so additional instance creation is gonna be pretty quick. In this case, just took 600, well, just shy of 700 milliseconds to create a new instance. And you can see it's pretty consistent. Now, if we go into one of those instances and look at the disk usage, we can see here the same UUID of the BurFS file system. And here you can see the totality of the backing device, which is 1.7 terabytes large. Now, one thing that's a bit funny uh, with BurFS is the way this is reported in general. Uh, it is unfortunately not um, namespaced in any way. So if I say read let's read a bunch of uh, of store well, write a file with a bunch of random data inside it. Uh, so actually use your random oops oh, uh, oops typo you random there we go. So that should create uh, 400 megs of random stuff inside of a blah.img file. All right, now if we look at the disk usage, a, we can see it grew a bit uh, to 508. 
Um, yeah, let's see if that true further. Yeah, it did. So that's part of the kind of quota thing that happens in background that I mentioned earlier. As you can see, we first we rolled 419 megs to this care. And we went from 489 entry to 508. And then it took quite a few seconds before it would actually record the used space up to 900 megs. Now, that also means that if there was a quota applied, we could actually have potentially spiked past it. Uh, and then every write would be blocked until you clear enough space to get below the quota again. So that's that's the weirdness there with PerFS. The other thing is now if I go inside of one another container and you look at the disk usage, you can see the exact same thing, which means that the used value here is not specific to the container. It is global to the entire file system. It gets slightly worse because if we do set a limit, so on U2 and we do the root disk and size, say put it uh, up to I don't know, 500 megs. Okay, we go inside the container and same thing, the container still does not see what kind of limit it has applied to itself. It sees the overall usage and overall size of the entire file system. Um, that's not necessarily ideal because the application running in the container has absolutely no visibility on any kind of quota that might be in place. So say we write a bunch of random again. Now, the ref has decided to um, enforce quota kind of pathway through. So we got to write 27 megs and then hit this quota exceeded. But if you look at the disk, uh, disk free output, you can still see that we are only using 1% uh, and that is supposedly 1.7 terabytes left. So again, that's not something we can do anything about inside of LexD. It's really kind of a bit of a limitation of BRFS itself. That's worth keeping in mind because that can that can cause issues in some environments. Now, one thing we can show, um, assuming the quota is freed, yeah, it didn't yet. So that's the other thing is clearing a file can take a while before the quota itself um, recalculates and lets you write. So I'm just gonna use another container. So that's a bit faster. Okay, got RFS itself installed inside of the container. So now that let's just uh, play with nesting a tiny bit. So that's one of the nice properties of RFS is that you can actually do this. And that will have created a new subvolume uh, called foo, at which point we can we could write files inside it if we wanted. So we could do another DD in there. Give it a few seconds to complete. And that will have write, written yeah, a new blah.img file, 400 megs inside of a foo dataset. Um, again, if you one here had a quota set, now what I did just now would actually have bypassed it. Uh, that foo, the volume I created, is not tied to the same quota group as the container um, and therefore can bypass the quota. So again, something to keep in mind there. Uh, but now I can delete the subvolume and it's gone. Um, another thing I can show probably for nesting, let's do... Uh, let's do the full Ubuntu image that includes LXD. It will save us a tiny bit of time. Call that U4 and let's enable nesting. So that's going to be downloading the larger official Ubuntu image that ships with uh, SnapD and with LXD pre installed. And we'll create a container from it with nesting enabled. So that will get us LXD 5.0 inside there. And when Initializing that LexD, it should let us use BurFS um, as the backend for that LexD. So effectively using BurFS nested through LexD. And that's the only storage backend that supports that right now. So as I mentioned, uh, ZFS is actually gaining support for that. It was merged upstream just a couple of weeks ago. So hopefully the next major version of ZFS will also support nested usage, uh, which LexD can then enable. And the same kind of feature will be possible inside of uh, a ZFS backed container. Okay, uh, so no clustering. We want to create a new default storage pool. And here you can see that LexD correctly detected that it is running inside the container on top of BurFS. And so offers only the two options uh, that are actually possible in this environment, which would be BurFS or directory, and it prefers BurFS. So we can just hit enter, and we can see that here it says, would you like to create a new breakfast subvolume under Vastnap LexD command LexD? Default is yes, and it should just work fine. 
And here we go. And now if we launch another Ubuntu container, that will do the exact same thing as on the host, where it's going to download the image, unpack it inside of BRFS uh, as a subvolume, and then launch. So unlike normal nesting, where the only backend that you can use would be a directory backend, in this case, you are actually using BRFS, uh, and yeah, it's pretty quick. And that's pretty much it for BRFS. Uh, there's really not a ton, um, a ton more to say here. Um, one thing that might be interesting to mention is the fact that BRFS can be nested is also the reason why we're using it for the LexD online demo service. Uh, so if I just load this in a different time, so we're going to our website and then do trade online. The online demo here is actually, so what you get, you get a terminal down there inside of a container that's running on next day. And it's using, I forgot to find out in the world. Yeah. So it's itself using, well, it just reports ShiftFS, which is not really helpful here, uh, but it's actually backed by BRFS. And so the LexD daemon that's running on it is itself using BRFS, which then gets us the same benefit of being able to quickly um, launch containers. So if I do the same thing, get U1, it will download the image and pack it, and, every, and then when you create another container, it can do just copy and write. And yeah, we're actively using the fact that BRFS is the only thing that can nest to do this. Uh, I expect that as soon as ZFS releases with a version that supports nesting, we're going to be moving uh, this environment to it as well, just to avoid potential issues with quotas, as this is an environment we would really like quotas to be enforced properly. But yeah, there you go. So um, this was a pretty brief look at BRFS and NextD. I hope this was useful to you. If you've got any questions around it, please feel free to leave them down below or on our community forum. The documentation again uh, has been refreshed recently and should cover pretty much all of those points. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.